The following is a conversation with Judea Pearl, a professor at UCLA and a winner of the Turing Award that's generally recognized as the Nobel Prize of Computing. He's one of the seminal figures in the field of artificial intelligence, computer science, and statistics. He has developed and championed probabilistic approaches to AI, including Beijing networks and profound ideas in causality in general. These ideas are important, not just to AI, but to our understanding and practice of science. But in the field of AI, the idea of causality, cause and effect, to many, lie at the core of what is currently missing and what must be developed in order to build truly intelligent systems. For this reason, and many others, his work is worth returning to often. I recommend his most recent book called Book of Why, that presents key ideas from a lifetime of work in a way that is accessible to the general public. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter, Alex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts especially, but also CastBox or comment on YouTube, Consider mentioning topics, people, ideas, questions, quotes, and science, tech, and philosophy that you find interesting, and I'll read them on this podcast. I won't call out names, but I love comments with kindness and thoughtfulness in them, so I thought I'd share them with you. Someone on YouTube highlighted a quote from the conversation with Noam Chomsky, where he said that the significance of your life is something you create. I like this line as well. On most days, the existentialist approach to life is one I find liberating and fulfilling. I recently started doing ads at the end of the introduction. I'll do one or two minutes after introducing the episode and never any ads in the middle that break the flow of the conversation. I hope that works for you and doesn't hurt the listening experience. This show is presented by Cash App, the number one finance app in the App Store. I personally use Cash App to send money to friends, but you can also use it to buy, sell, and deposit Bitcoin in just seconds. Cash App also has a new investing feature. You can buy fractions of a stock, say $1 worth, no matter what the stock price is. Brokerage services are provided by Cash App Investing, a subsidiary of Square, a member of SIPC. I'm excited to be working with Cash App to support one of my favorite organizations called FIRST, best known for their FIRST robotics and Lego competitions. They educate and inspire hundreds of thousands of students in over 110 countries and have a perfect rating on Charity Navigator, which means the donated money is used to the maximum effectiveness. When you get Cash App from the App Store or Google Play and use code LEXPODCAST, you'll get $10 and Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, which again is an organization that I've personally seen inspire girls and boys to dream of engineering a better world. And now, here's my conversation with Judea Pearl. You mentioned in an interview that science is not a collection of facts, but a constant human struggle with the mysteries of nature. What was the first mystery that you can recall that hooked you, that captivated you? Oh, the curiosity? first mystery, that's a good one. Yeah, I remember that. What I was had it? a fever for three days. When I learned about Descartes analytic geometry, and I found out that you can do all the construction in geometry using algebra, and I couldn't get over it. I simply couldn't get out of bed. I <laughs> so what, what kind of world does analytic geometry unlock? Well, it connects algebra with the geometry. Okay, so Descartes had the idea that um, <clears throat> geometrical construction and geometrical theorems and uh, assumptions can be articulated in the language of algebra, which means that all the proof that we did in high school in trying to prove that the three bisectors meet at one point and that, uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all this can be proven by just shuffling around notation. Yeah, uh, that was a the traumatic connection, experience. The, the tra traumatic experience. For me, it was. I'm telling so you. So right? it's the connection between the different mathematical disciplines that they all. No, it's in between two, di two different just languages. Even, languages. Yeah. So which mathematical discipline is most beautiful? Is geometry it? 
for you? Both are beautiful. They have uh, almost the same power. But there's a visual element to geometry. Being a, a visual, it's more transparent. But uh, once you get over to algebra, then uh, a linear equation is a straight line. This translation is easily absorbed. Okay? And um, the, to pass a tangent to a circle, uh, you know, <laughs> you have the basic theorems and you can do it with algebra. So, But uh, the transition from one to another was really, I thought that Descartes was the greatest mathematician of all times. <laughs> so you have been at the, if you think of engineering and mathematics as a spectrum. Yes. Uh, you have been, you have walked casually along this spectrum throughout your throughout your life you know a little bit of engineering and then you know uh you have been, done a little bit of mathematics here and there <laughs> not a little bit i mean we got a very solid background in mathematics because our teachers were geniuses yeah. our teachers came from germany in the 1930s running away from hitler uh, they left their careers in Heidelberg and Berlin and came to teach high school in Israel. And we were the beneficiary of that experiment. So I, and they taught us math the good way. What's the good way to teach math? Chronologically. The people. The people behind the theorems, yeah. Their cousins and their nieces and their faces. <laughs> And how they jumped from the bathtub when they screamed, Eureka! <laughs> and ran naked in town. <laughs> so you're almost educated as a historian of math. No, we just got a glimpse of that history together with the theorem. So every um, exercise in math was connected with the person. So and the, the time of the person. The period. The period also mathematically speaking. Mathematically speaking, yes. Not the politics. Yeah. No. So, and then in uh, in university, you have you have gone on to do engineering. Yeah, I get a BS in engineering in Technion, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, I moved here for graduate work, and I got to, I did engineering uh, in addition to physics in Rutgers, mm -hmm. and it would combine very nicely with my thesis, which I did in RCA laboratories in superconductivity. And then somehow thought to switch to uh, almost computer science software, even, even uh, not switch, but long to become, to get into software engineering a little bit, almost yes. even programming, if you can call it that in the 70s. So th there's all these disciplines. Yeah. If you were to pick a favor, what, uh, in terms of engineering and mathematics, which path do you think has more beauty? Which path has more power? It's hard to choose, no. I enjoy doing physics. I even have a vortex named on my name. So I have a, a investment in immortality. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, so what, what is a vortex? Vortex is in superconductivity. In the superconductivity. If you have yeah. permanent current uh, swirling around, one way or the other, you can have a store one or zero for a computer. That was what we worked on in the 1960s, RCA. And uh, I discovered a few nice phenomena with the vortices. You push so the current and they move. Vortex. Pearl vortex, right? You can Google it, <laughs> right? I, I didn't know about it, but the physicist uh, picked up on my thesis, on my uh, PhD thesis, and uh, the... Um, it became popular when thin film superconductors became important for high temperature superconductors. So they called it uh, pearl vortex without my knowledge. I discovered it only about 15 years ago. You have footprints in all of the sciences. So let's talk about the universe a little bit. Is the universe at the lowest level deterministic or stochastic in your amateur philosophy view? Put another way, does God play dice? Well, we we know it is stochastic, right? Because today, today we think it is stochastic. Yes. We think because we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and we have some experiments to um, confirm that. All we have is experiments to confirm it. We don't understand why. Why is already... You wrote a book about yes. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a puzzle. 
It's a puzzle that you have the uh, dice uh, flipping machine or god and the uh, and the uh, result of the flipping propagate with the speed faster than the speed of light right. <laughs> we can't explain that okay so um, but it it only governs microscopic phenomena so you don't think of quantum mechanics as useful no. uh, for no, understanding the nature of reality no it's diversionary so in your thinking the world might as well be deterministic. The world is deterministic, and as far as the new one firing is concerned, it is deterministic to first approximation. What about free will? Free will is also a nice exercise. Free will is an illusion that illusion. we AI people are going to solve. So what do you think, once we solve it, that solution will look like? Once we the put it in the page. will look like, first of all, it will look like a machine. A machine that acts as though it has free will. It communicates with other machines as though they have free will. And you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a machine that does and a machine that doesn't have free will. Okay? So the illusion, it propagates the illusion of free will amongst the other machines. And, and faking it is having it. Okay, that's what Turing test is all about. Yes. Faking intelligence is intelligent because it's not easy to fake. It's very hard to fake. And you can only fake if you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's such a beautiful statement. <laughs> that's yeah, you could yeah. Yeah, you, you can't know, fake it if you don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let, let's begin at the beginning with probability, uh, both philosophically and mathematically. What, what does it mean to say the probability of something happening is 50%? What is probability? It's a degree of uncertainty that an agent has about the world. You're still expressing some knowledge in that statement. Of course. If the probability is 90%, it's absolutely a different kind of knowledge than if it is 10%. <clears throat> but it's still not solid knowledge. It's... It is solid knowledge, but hey, if you tell me that 90% uh, assurance smoking will um, give you lung cancer in five years versus 10%, it's a piece of useful knowledge. So the statistical view of the universe yeah. Why is it useful? So we're swimming in complete uncertainty. Most yeah. of everything around It allows around. you to predict things with a certain probability, and computing those probabilities are very useful. That's uh, the whole idea of, uh, of prediction. And you need prediction to be able to survive. If you cannot predict the future, then you're just uh, crossing the street will be extremely uh, fearful. And so you've done a lot of work in causation, and so let's let's think about correlation. I started with the probability. You started with probability. You've yes. invented the Bayesian networks. Yeah. And so you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll dance back and forth between these levels of uh, okay. uh, uncertainty. But what what is correlation? What is it? So probability of something happening is something, but then there's a bunch of things happening. And uh, sometimes they happen together, sometimes not. They're independent or not. So how do you think about correlation of things? Correlation occurs when two things vary together over a very long time. is one way of measuring it. Or when you have a bunch of variables that they all vary cohesively. Um, then we call it, we have a correlation here. And usually when we think about correlation, we really think causally. Things and cannot be correlated unless there is a reason for them to vary together. Why should they vary together? If they don't see each other, why should they vary together? So underlying it somewhere is causation. Yes. Hidden in our intuition, there is a notion of causation because we cannot grasp any other logic except causation. And how does conditional probability differ from causation? So what is conditional probability? 
conditional probability, how things vary, when one of them uh, stays the same. Now, staying the same means that I have chosen to look only at those incidents where the guy has the same value as previous one. It's my choice as an experimenter. So things that are not correlated before could become correlated. Like, for instance, if I have two coins which are uncorrelated, okay, and I choose only those flippings experiments in which a bell rings, and a bell rings when at least one of them is a tail, okay, then suddenly I see correlation between the two coins because I only look at the cases where the bell rang. So you see, it's my design, with my ignorance, essentially, with my uh, audacity to ignore certain incidents, I suddenly create a correlation where it doesn't exist physically. Right, so that's, you just outlined one of the flaws of observing the world and, and trying to infer something fundamental about the world from looking at the correlation. I don't look at it as a flaw, the world works like that. Which, but it, the flaws comes if we try to impose hmm. um, causal logic on correlation, it doesn't work too well. So, I mean, but that's exactly what we do. That's what uh, that has been the majority of science. Is the majority of, of naive science. Statisticians know it. Statisticians know that if you condition on a third variable, then you can destroy or create correlations among two other variables. Right. They know it. It's in the data. Right. There's nothing surprising. That's why they all dismiss the Simpson paradox. Ah, we know it. They don't know anything about it. <laughs> well, there's uh, there's disciplines like psychology where all the variables are hard to get, to account for, and so uh, oftentimes there's a leap between correlation to causation. You're, you're imposing. What do you mean, a leap? Uh, who, who is trying to get causation from correlation? No not, not, you're not proving causation, but you're <laughs> sort of uh, uh, discussing it, uh, implying, sort of hypothesizing without ability to. Prove. Which discipline do you have in mind? I'll tell you if they are obsolete, or if they are <laughs> outdated, or they are about to get outdated. Yes. Or Yes. Yeah, tell me which one do you have? <laughs> well, psychology, you know. It's okay, uh, what, is it SEM? Structural equation? No, no, I was thinking of applied psychology studying. Um, for example, we work with human behavior in semi-autonomous vehicles, how people behave. And you have to conduct these studies of people driving cars. Everything starts with a question. What is a research question? What is a research question? Uh, the research question, do people fall asleep when the car is <clears throat> driving itself. Do they fall asleep or do they tend to fall asleep more frequently? More frequently. Than with the car not driving no, it's itself. Not driving itself. That's a good question, okay. And so you measure, you put people in the car because it's real world. You can't conduct an experiment where you control everything. Why can't you con You could. Turn the uh, aut automat automatic uh, module on and off. Because it's on road public. I mean, there's you have uh, it's uh, there's aspects to it that's unethical, because it's testing on public roads. Uh -huh. So you can only use vehicle. You they have to uh, the people the drivers themselves have to make that choice themselves, mm -hmm. and so they regulate that, and, and so you just observe when they drive it mm -hmm. autonomously and when they don't. And then, but maybe they turn it off when they were very tired. Yeah, that kind okay. of thing. But you you don't know those yeah, variables. Okay, so that you have now uncontrolled experiment. Uncontrolled experiment. We, we call it observational study. Yeah. And we form the correlation uh, detected. We have to infer causal relationship, yeah. whether it was the automatic piece that caused them to fall asleep or... Okay, so that is an um, issue that is... Uh, about uh, 120 years old. <laughs> yeah. I should only go 100 years old. Okay. And uh, <laughs> Let's count. 
Oh, maybe it's no. Actually, I should say it's 2,000 years old because we have this experiment by Daniel about the Babylonian king mm-hmm. that uh, wanted um, the exile, the people from Israel that were taken in, in exile to Babylon to serve the king. He wanted to serve them king's food, which was meat, and Daniel, as a good Jew, couldn't eat a non-kosher food, so he asked them to eat vegetarian food. But the king overseer says, I'm sorry, but if the king sees that your um, performance falls below that of other kids, you know, he's going to kill me. Mm-hmm. Daniel said, let's make an experiment. Let's take four of us from Jerusalem, okay, give us vegetarian food. Let's take the other guys that <clears throat> to eat the king's food, and in about a week's time, we'll test our performance. And you know the answer. Of course, he did the experiment, and uh, they were so much better than the others. And the kings nominated them to super <laughs> position in his case. So it was the first experiment. Yes. So the, there was a very simple, it's also the same research questions. We want to know if vegetarian food um, assists or obstructs uh, your mental ability. And... Uh, Okay, so that put, the question is very old one. Even um, Democritus said, um, if I could discover one cause of things, uh, I would rather discover one cause and be a king of Persia. Okay, the, the task of discovering causes was in the mind of ancient people from many, many years ago. But... The mathematics of doing that was only developed in the 1920s. So science has left us often. Okay? Science has not provided us with the mathematics to capture the idea of X causes Y and Y does not cause X. Because all the equations of physics are symmetrical, algebraic. The equality sign goes both ways. Okay, let's look at machine learning. Machine learning today, if you look at deep neural networks, you can think of it as a kind of conditional probability conditional estimators. Probability. Correct. Beautiful. So, where did, where did you um, say that? What? Conditional probability estimators. None of the machine learning people clubbed you, attacked you. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> mo, uh, mo, <laughs> most people, and this is why this today's conversation I think is interesting, is most people would agree with you. Yeah. Uh, there are certain aspects that are just effective today, but we're going to hit a wall and there's a lot of ideas. Uh, I think you're very right that we're going to have to return to about causality. And I, uh, it would be, let, let's try to explore it. Okay. Let's, let's, let's even take a step back. You've invented uh, Bayesian networks that look awfully a lot like they express something like causation, but they don't, not necessarily. So how do we turn Bayesian networks into expressing causation? How do we build causal networks? This A causes B, B causes C. How do we start to infer that kind of thing? We start asking ourselves a question. What are the factors that would determine the value of X? X could be blood pressure, uh, death, um, hungry, hunger. But these are hypotheses that we propose. Hypothesis, for everything which has to do with causality comes from a theory. Okay. The difference is only what kind, how you interrogate the theory that you have in your mind. So it still needs the human expert to propose. All right. You need the human expert to specify yeah. the initial model. Initial model could be very qualitative. Just who listens to whom? By whom listen to, I mean one variable listen to the other. So I say, okay, the tide is listening to the moon and not to the rooster crow. Okay? And so forth. This is our understanding of the world in which we live scientific understanding of reality. 
We have to start there. Because if we don't know how to handle cause and effect relationship, when we do have a model, and we certainly do not know how to handle it when we don't have a model. So let's start first. In AI, slogan is representation first, discovery second. Mm-hmm. But if I give you all the information that you need, can you do anything useful with it? That is the first, representation. How do you represent it? I give you all the knowledge in the world. How do you represent it? When you represent it, I ask you, can you infer X or Y or Z? Can you answer certain queries? Is it uh, complex? Is it polynomial? It, all the computer science exercises mm-hmm. we do, once you give me a representation for my knowledge, then you can ask me, now I understand how to represent things, how do I discover them? It's a secondary thing. So first of all, we, I, I should echo the statement that mathematics and the current much of the machine learning world has not considered causation that A causes B, Correct. just in anything. So that that seems like a, uh, that seems like a non-obvious thing that you, you think we would have really acknowledged it, but we haven't. So we, we have to put that on the table. So uh, knowledge, how hard is it to create a knowledge from which to work? In certain area, it's easy because we have only four or five major variables. Okay. And uh, an epidemiologist or an economist can put them down. Uh, what the minimum wage, uh, unemployment, policy, X, Y, Z, um, and start collecting data and quantify the parameters that were left unquantified with the initial knowledge. Okay, that's the routine work that you find in experimental psychology, yes. in economics, e- everywhere, in the, in the health science. That's a routine thing. But I should emphasize, you should start with a research question. What do you want to estimate? Once you have that, you have to have a language of expressing what you want to estimate. You think it's easy? No. So we can talk about two things. I think one is um, how the science of causation is very useful for at, uh, answering certain questions. And then the other is how do we create intelligent systems uh, that need to reason with causation? So if my research question is, how do I pick up this water bottle from the table? Uh, the, all the knowledge that is required to be able to do that. How do we construct that knowledge base? Does it? Do we return back to the problem that we didn't solve in the 80s with expert systems? Do we have to solve that problem of automated construction of knowledge? Mm. You're talking about the uh, task of eliciting knowledge from an expert. Task of eliciting knowledge from an expert or the self-discovery of more knowledge, uh, more and more knowledge. So automating the building of knowledge as much as possible. It's a different game in the causal domain because it's, it's essentially the same thing. You have to start with some knowledge and you're trying to enrich it. But you don't mm-hmm. enrich it by asking for more rules, you enrich it by asking for the data, for, to look at the data and quantifying and ask queries that you couldn't answer when you started. You couldn't because it, it, the, the question is quite complex and it's not within the um, capability of ordinary cognition, of ordinary person, ordinary expert even, to answer. So what kind of questions do you think we can st- start to answer? Even a simple one. Suppose, uh, yeah, I start with easy one. Let's do it. Okay, what's the effect of a drug on recovery? Uh, what did the aspirin that caused my headache to be cured? Or what did the television program? Or the good news I received? Um, this is already, you see, it's a difficult question because it's 
find the cause from effect. The easy one is find effect from cause. That's right. So first you construct a model saying that this is an important research question. This is an yes. important question. Then you, you no, no, have- I didn't construct a model yet. I just said it's an important question. important question. And the first exercise is express it mathematically. What do you want to prove? Like, if I tell you what's the, what will be the effect of taking this drug, okay, you have to say that in mathematics. How do you say that? Yes. Can you write down the question, not the answer? I want to find the effect of the drug on my headache. Right. You write down. Write, write it down. That's where the do calculus comes in. Yes. <laughs> do operator. What do you do operator? Do operator, yeah. Uh, which is nice. A... It's the difference between association and intervention. Correct. Very beautifully sort of constructed. Yeah. So we co we have a do operator. So the do calculus connect it on the do operator itself connects the operation of doing to something that we can see. Right. So as opposed to the purely observing, you're making the choice to change a yeah. variable. That's what it it expresses. And then the way that we interpret it, the mechan mechanism by which we take your query and we translate it into something that we can work with is by giving it semantics, saying that you have a model of the world and you cut off all the incoming arrow into X and you're looking now in the modified, mutilated model, you ask for the probability of Y. That is interpretation of doing X because by doing things, you liberate them from all influences that acted upon them earlier, and you subject them to the tyranny of your muscles. So you, you remove all the questions about causality by doing them. So no, you're now, there's one you're, level you're, of questions. Yeah. Answer questions about what will happen if you do things. If you do, if you drink the coffee, if you take the aspirin. Right. So how do we get the once? How do we get the doing data? <laughs> ah, now the question is, um, if we cannot run experiments, right? Then we have to rely on observational studies. So As, first, we could sorry to interrupt. We could run an experiment, yeah, where we do something, where we drink the coffee and don't. And this, the the do operator allows you to sort of be systematic about expressing. To that. imagine how the experiment will look like, even though we cannot physically and technologically conduct it. I'll give you an example. What is the effect of blood pressure on mortality? Hmm. I cannot go down into your vein and change your blood pressure, but I can ask the question, which means I can, if I have a model of your body, I can imagine the effect of your, how the um, blood pressure change will affect your mortality. How? I go into the model and I conduct this surgery about the <laughs> blood pressure, even though physically I can do, I cannot do it. Let me ask the quantum mechanics question. Does the doing change the observation? <laughs> Meaning the surgery of changing the blood pressure is, um, I mean. It's no, the kind of, surgery is uh, called uh, um, very delicate. It's very delicate, infinitely delicate. <laughs> incisive and delicate, which means, do means, do X means, I'm gonna touch only X. Only X. Directly into X. So that means that I change only things which depends on X by virtue of X changing. But I don't depend things which are not dependent on X. Like I wouldn't change your sex or your age, I just change your blood pressure. Okay. So in the case of blood pressure, it may be difficult or impossible to construct such an experiment. No, so, but physically, yes. But hypothetically, no. Hypothetically, no. If we have a model, that is what the model is for. So you conduct a, um, surgeries on a model, you mm -hmm. take it apart, put it back. That's the idea of a model. Yeah. It's the idea of thinking counterfactually, imagining, and that's the idea of uh, creativity. So by constructing that model, you can start to infer if the higher, the blood pressure leads to mortality, which increases or decreases by- I construct the model, I can still cannot answer it. 
I have to see if I have enough information in the model that will allow me to find out the effects of intervention from a non-interventional study, from observation, hands-off study. Right. So what's needed to make You need that? to have assumptions about who affects whom. If the, if the graph had a certain property, the answer is yes, you can get it from observational study. Mm -hmm. If the graph is too meshy, bushy, bushy, the answer is no, you cannot. Then you need to find either different kind of observation that you haven't considered or one experiment. So basically, does that, put, that puts a lot of pressure on you to encode wisdom into that graph. Correct. But you, you don't have to encode more than what you know. God forbid, <laughs> if you put the, like economists are doing this, they call identifying assumptions. They put assumptions, even if they don't prevail in the world, they put assumptions so they can identify things. But the That's problem not. is, yes, beautifully put, but the problem is you don't know what you don't know. So... You know what you don't know. Because if you don't know, you say it's possible, it's possible that X affect the uh, traffic tomorrow. When I'm, it, it's possible. You put down an arrow which says it's possible. Every arrow in the graph says it's possible. So there's not a significant cost to adding arrows that... The more arrow you add, the, better. the less likely you are to identify things from purely observational data. So if the whole world is bushy, and everybody affects everybody else, the answer is, you can answer it ahead of time. I cannot answer my query from observational data. I have to go to experiments. So you talk about machine learning as essentially learning by association or reasoning by association, and this do calculus is allowing for intervention I like that word, uh, but action. So you also talk about counterfactuals. Yeah. And I'm trying to sort of understand the difference in counterfactuals and intervention. Uh, what's the, well, first of all, what is counterfactuals and why are they useful? Why are they especially uh, useful as opposed to just reasoning what, what effect actions have? But counterfactual contains what we normally call explanations. Can you give an example? And if of a I tell you that acting one way affects something else, I didn't explain anything yet. But if I if I ask you, uh, was it the aspirin that cure my headache? I'm asking for explanation. What cure my headache? Mm. And putting a finger on aspirin provide an explanation. It was the aspirin that was responsible for your headache going away. If if you didn't take the aspirin, you would still have a headache. So by, by saying, if I didn't take aspirin, I would have a headache, you're thereby saying that aspirin is the thing that removed the headache. Yes, but you have to have another important information. I took the aspirin, and my headache is gone. Okay. It's very important information. Now I'm reasoning backward. And I said, what did the aspirin? Yeah. Okay. By considering what would have happened if everything else is the same, but I didn't take aspirin. That's right. So you That's know that things took place. You know, Joe killed Shmo. Yeah. Okay? And Shmo would, would be alive had John not used his gun. Right. Okay, so that is the counterfactual. It, it, it conf had a confliction, it had a conflict here or clash between observed fact that he, he did shoot, okay, and the hypothetical predicate which says, had he not shot, you have a clash, a logical clash. They cannot exist together. That's the counterfactual. And that is the source of our explanation of our, the idea of responsibility, regret, and free will. Yeah, so it certainly seems uh, that's the highest level of reasoning, right? It's yes, and physicists do it all the time. Who does it all the time? Physicists. Physicists. In every equation of physics, let's say you have a Hooke's law, 
and you put uh, one kilogram on the spring, and the spring is one meter, and you say, had this weight been two kilograms, the spring would have been twice as long. It's no problem in, for physicists mm. to say that, except that mathematics is only in, is in the form of equation, okay? equating the weight, proportionality constant, and the length of the string. So you don't have the asymmetry in the equation of physics, although every physicist thinks counterfactually. Ask high school kids. Mm -hmm. Had the weight been three kilograms, what would be the length of the spring? And they can answer it immediately because they do the counterfactual processing in their mind and then they put it into equation, algebraic equation, and they solve it. Okay? But a robot cannot do that. How do you make a robot learn these relationships? Uh, well, or, and why do you put learn? Suppose you learn. tell him, can you do it? So before you go learning, yeah. You have to ask yourself, suppose I give him all the information. Okay? Can, the, can the robot perform the task that I ask him to perform? Can he reason and say, no, it wasn't the aspirin. It was the good news you received on the phone. Right, because, well, unless the robot had a model, uh, a, a causal um, model of the world. Right, right. Like, I'm right. sorry, I have to linger on this. But now we have to linger and we have to say, how do we, how do, we do it? How do we build it? Yes. How do we build a causal model without a, a team of human experts no, running why around? Don't, why don't you go to learning right away? You're too much involved with learning. Because I like babies. Babies learn fast. I'm trying oh, yeah. to figure out how they do it. Okay. Good. So, yeah. That's another question. How do the babies come out with the counterfactual model of the world? Yeah. And babies do that. Yeah. They know how to play with the, in the crib. They know which balls hits another one. Mm -hmm. And so they learn it by um, playful manipulation of the world. Yes. The simple world involves only toys and balls and chimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, if you think about it, it's a complex world. We take for granted yes. uh, how complicated. <laughs> and the <laughs> kids do it by playful manipulation yeah. plus parent guidance, peer wisdom, yeah. and hearsay. Yeah. They meet each other. Can they say, uh, you, sh you shouldn't have uh, taken my toy? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, and they these multiple sources of information they're able to integrate. Yeah. So the challenge is about how to integrate, how to form these causal relationships from different sources of data. Correct. So how, how, how much is information is it to play, how much causal information is required to be able to play in the crib with different objects? I, I don't know. I haven't <laughs> experimented with the crib. Okay, not a crib. Picking <laughs> up, it's a very interesting manipulating question. physical objects on this very, opening the pages uh, of a book, all the tasks, the, the physical manipulation tasks. Do you have a sense? Because my sense is the no, world is extremely complicated. Extremely complicated. I agree, and I don't know how to organize it because I've been spoiled by easy problems such as cancer and death. Okay. <laughs> yes, so first, we have to start. No, trying but it's to, yeah. easy. The easy in the sense that you have only uh, twenty variables, yes. and they are just variables and not mechanics. Yes. Okay, it's easy. You, you just put them on the graph, and they 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 speak to you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you you're providing a methodology for for having, letting them yes. speak. Yeah, so I'm working only in the abstract. Yes. The abstract was knowledge in, knowledge out, data in between. Now, can we take a leap to trying to learn in this very, when it's not 20 variables, but 20 million variables, trying to learn causation in this world? Not learn, but no, somehow it, construct it, models. I mean, it seems like you would only have to be able to learn because constructing it manually would be too difficult. Do you have ideas of? I think it's a matter of combining simple models from many, many sources, from mm. many, many disciplines, and many metaphors. 
Metaphors are the basics of human intelligence, basis. Yeah, so how, how do you think of about a metaphor in terms of its use in human intelligence? Uh, metaphors is an expert system. Mm -hmm. An expert, it, it's mapping problem with which you are not familiar to a problem with which you are familiar. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll give you a good example. The Greek believed that the sky is an opaque shell. It's not really out of space, infinite space. It's an opaque shell, and the stars are holes yeah. poked in the shell through which you see the eternal light. It was a metaphor. Why? Because they, are, they understand how you poke holes in the shells. Okay? They're not, they were not familiar with infinite space. And so, and and we are walking on a shell of a turtle, and if you get too close to the edge, you're going to fall down to Hades or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a metaphor. It's not true, but this kind of metaphor enabled Aristoteles to measure the radius of the Earth, hmm. because he said, "Come on, if the we are walking on a turtle shell, then a ray of light." coming to this angle will be different, uh, this place will be a different angle than coming to this place. I know the distance, I'll measure the two uh, angles, and then I have the radius of the shell of the, of the turtle. Mm -hmm. okay. And he did, and he found his measurements were very close to the measurements we have today, through the year, uh, what, 6,700 kilometers <laughs> of the Earth? That's something that would not ha occur to Babylonian astronomer, even though the Babylonian experiments were the machine learning people of the time. They fit curves, and they could predict the um, eclipse of the moon much more accurately than the Greek, because they fit curve. Uh, so that's a different metaphor. Mm -hmm. Something that you're familiar with. A game, a turtle shell. Okay? What does it mean that you are familiar? Familiar means that answers to certain questions are explicit. You don't have to derive them. And they were made explicit because somewhere in the past you've constructed a model of that uh, you, you, you're familiar with, so the child yeah. is familiar with billiard balls. Yes. So the child could predict that if you let loose of one ball, the other one will bounce off. These are, you, you obtain that by um, familiarity. Familiarity is answering questions, and you store the answer explicitly. You don't have to derive them. So this is the idea of a metaphor. All our life, all our intelligence is built around metaphors, mapping from the unfamiliar to the familiar. But the um, marriage between the two is a tough thing, which I, which we haven't yet been able to algorithmize. So you think of that process of of using metaphor to leap from one place to another. Is, we can call it reasoning. Is it a kind of reasoning? It is a reasoning by metaphor, metaphorical reasoning reason, by metaphor. Yeah. Do you think of that as learning? So learning is a popular terminology today in a narrow sense. It is, it is, it is definitely a form So you may not, uh, okay, right. It's one of the most important learning, taking something which theoretically is derivable yeah. and store it in accessible format. I'll give you an example, chess, okay? Finding the winning, winning starting move in chess is hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it, there is an answer. Either there is a winning move for white or there isn't, or there is a draw. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it is, the, uh, the answer to that is available through the rule of the games. But we don't know the answer. So what does a chess master have that we don't have? He has taught explicitly an evaluation of certain complex pattern of the board. We don't have it. Ordinary 
people like me, I don't know about you, uh, I'm not a chess master. So for me, I have to derive yes. things that for him is explicit. He has seen it before, or he has seen the pattern before, or similar pattern, you see, metaphor. Yeah. Yeah? And he generalized and said, don't move, it's a dangerous move. Uh, it's just that not in the game of chess, but in the game of uh, billiard balls, we humans are able to initially derive very effectively and then reason by metaphor very effectively and we make it look so easy that it makes one wonder how hard is it to build it in a machine. So in, in your sense, <laughs> uh, how far away are we to be able to construct? I don't know. I'm not a futurist. I can, all I can tell you is that we are making tremendous progress in the causal reasoning uh, domain. Okay? Something that I even dare to call it revolution, the causal revolution. Because uh, what we, we have achieved in the past uh, three decades is something that... Uh, dwarf everything that was derived in the entire history. So there's an excitement about current machine learning methodologies. And there's really important good work you're doing in causal inference. Where do the, where, where does the future, uh, where do these worlds collide and what does that look like? First, they're gonna work without collisions. <laughs> It's going to work in harmony. Harmony, it's not good. The, the right. human is going to uh, to uh, jumpstart the exercise by providing qualitative, non-committing models of how the universe works. Universe, I think we have, how the in the reality, the domain of discourse works. The machine is going to take over from that point of view and derive whatever the calculus says can be derived. Mm -hmm. Namely, quantitative answer to our questions. Right. These are complex questions. I'll give you some example of complex questions that uh, would buggle your mind if you think about it. You take result of studies in diverse population under diverse conditions and you infer the cause effect of a new population, which doesn't even resemble any of the ones studied. And you do that by do calculus. You do that by generalizing from one study to another. See, what's, what's common between the two? What is different? Let's ignore the differences and pull out the commonality. And you do it over maybe 100 hospitals in, around the world. From that, you can get really uh, uh, mileage from big data. It's not only you have many samples, you have many sources of data. So that that's a really powerful thing, and I think for, especially for medical applications, I mean, cure cancer, right? That's how from data you can cure cancer. So we're talking about causation, which is the temporal, temporal relationships between things. Not only temporal, it was structural and temporal. Temporal enough, uh, uh, temporal precedence by itself cannot replace causation. Is temporal precedence the era of time in physics? Yeah, it's important, necessary. It's important. But sufficient, yes. Is it? Yes. I never seen the cause uh, propagate backward. But if we call, if we use the word cause, yes. but. There's relationships that are timeless. I suppose that's still forward in the era of time. But the are there relationships, logical relationships, that fit into the structure? Sure, the whole uh, do calculus is logical relationship. That doesn't require a temporal. It, it has just the condition that it it you're not traveling back in time. Yes, correct. So it's really a generalization of a powerful generalization uh, of what... Of Boolean logic. Yeah, Boolean logic. Yes. 
that is sort of simply put and allows us to uh you know reason uh reason about the order of events the source the not about which means we're not deriving the order of event we are given cause effect relationship okay they ought to be obeying the the uh, time president relationship we are given that and now that we ask questions about other cause of relationship that could be derived from the initial ones but were not given to us explicitly yeah like um, in the case of the, the firing squad I gave you mm -hmm. uh, in the first chapter and I ask what if uh, rifleman a declined to shoot would the prisoner still be dead mm -hmm. to decline to shoot it means that he disobey order and and the, the rule of the games were that he is a uh, obedient and marksman mm -hmm. okay that's how you start that's the initial order but now you ask questions about breaking the rules so what if he decided not to pull the trigger he just became a pacifist oh. and you can you and I can answer that mm -hmm. the other rifleman would have killed him okay I want a machine to do that. Is it so hard to ask a machine to do that? It's such a simple task. No. No? But you have to have a calculus for that. Yes. yes. Yeah. But the curiosity, the natural curiosity for me is that, yes, you're absolutely correct and important. And uh, it's hard to believe that we haven't done this seriously, uh, extensively, already a long time ago. So this, this is really important work. But I also want to know, you know, there's uh, maybe you can philosophize about how hard is it to learn. Okay, let's assume we're learning. We want to learn it, okay? We want to learn. So what do we do? We put a learning machine that watches execution trials uh, in many countries and many <laughs> locations, okay? Mm -hmm. All the machine can learn is to see shot or not shot, dead, not dead. A court issued an order or didn't, okay? Just the facts. Mm -hmm. From the fact you don't know who listens to whom. You don't know that the condemned person listened to the bullets, that the bullets are <laughs> listening to the yeah. captain, okay? Mm -hmm. All we hear is one command, two shots, dead, okay? A triple of variables. Yes, no, yes, no. Okay. From that you can learn who listens to whom, and you can answer the question, no. Definitively no. But don't you think you can start proposing ideas for humans to review? You want machine to learn it, right? You want a robot. So a robot is wa watching yeah. uh, trials like that, yep. uh, 200 trials, and then he has to answer the question, what if rifleman A refrained from shooting? Yeah. So how do you do that? <laughs> That's exactly my point. That looking at the facts don't give you the strings Absolutely. behind the facts. Absolutely. But do you think of machine learning, as it's currently defined, as only something that looks at the facts and tries right to Right now, they only look at the facts. Yeah. So is there a way to modify, yeah. the, in, in your sense? Playful you, manipulation. Playful manipulation. Yes. Once in doing a while, the interventionist kind of thing. Yes. Intervention. But it, it could be at random. For instance, the mm -hmm. rifleman is sick on that day, or he just uh, vomits or whatever. So the machine can observe this unexpected event which introduced noise. The noise still have to be uh, random to be able to um, uh, relate it to randomized experiment. And then you have a um, observational studies from which to infer the strings behind the facts. Mm -hmm. It's doable to a certain extent. But now that we are expert in what you can do once you have a model, we can reason back and say what do you, kind of data you need to build a model. Got it. So I know you're not a futurist, but are you excited? Have you, when you look back at your life, long for the idea of creating a human level intelligence system. Yeah, I'm, I'm driven by that. All my life I'm driven just by one thing. <laughs> but I go slowly. I go from what I know to the next step incrementally. 
So without imagining what the end goal looks like. Do you imagine what yeah. an and eight- the end goal is going to be a machine that can answer sophisticated questions, questions. counterfactuals of regret, compassion, um, responsibility, and free will. So what is a good test? Is a Turing test a, a reasonable test? test? Free will doesn't exist yet. Uh, there's no, How would you test free will? Uh, that's, uh, so far, we know only one thing. I mean, <laughs> if m- m- robots can communicate with reward and punishment among themselves and hitting each other on the wrist and say you shouldn't have done that, mm-hmm. okay, um, playing better soccer because they can do that. What do you mean because they can do that? Because they can communicate among themselves. Because of the communication, of, they can do Because the they communicate, like us, yeah. reward and punishment. Yes, you didn't pass the ball the right, the right time, and so forth. Therefore, you're going to sit on the bench for the next two. If they start communicating like that, the question is, will they play better soccer? As opposed to what? As opposed to what they do now. Without this ability to reason about uh, uh, reward and punishment, responsibility. And it, uh, so far, I can only think about communication. Communication is, and in, in not necessarily natural language, but just communication. No, just communication, and that's important yeah. to have a quick and effective means of communicating knowledge. If the coach tells you you should have passed the ball, ping, he conveys so much knowledge to you as opposed to what? Go down and change your software. Right, that's the alternative. But the coach doesn't know your software. Right. So how can a coach tell you you should have passed the ball? But that <laughs> our language is very effective. You should have passed the ball. You know your software. You tweak the right module, okay? And next time you don't do it. Now that's for playing soccer where the rules are well-defined. No, 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 no. Well, they're not well-defined. When you should pass the ball... It's not the well-defined. Ball. No, it's... Uh, it's yeah. very soft, well, very it's, noisy. Yeah. Yes, you have to do it under pressure. <laughs> it's art. Uh, but uh, in terms of aligning values between computers and humans, do you think this cause and effect uh, type of thinking is important to align the values? Values, morals, mm-hmm. ethics under which the machines make decisions. Is, yeah. is the cause effect where the two can come together? Cause of fact, is a necessary component right. to build right. a ethical machine. Because the machine has to empathize, to understand what's good for you, to build a model of, your, of you right. as a recipient, which should be very much, what, what is compassion? They imagine that you suffer pain as much as me. As much as okay? me. Empathy. I do have already a model of myself. Right? So it's very easy for me to map you to mine. I don't have to rebuild the model. It's much easier to say, oh, you're like me. Okay, therefore I would not hate you. (laughs) And the machine has to imagine, uh, has to try to fake to be human, essentially, so you can imagine that you're, that you're like me, right? And moreover, who who is me? That's the first, that's consciousness. They have a model of yourself. Where do you get this model? You look at yourself as if you are a part of the environment. If you build a model of yourself versus the environment, then you can say, I need to have a model of myself. I have abilities, I have desires, and so forth. Okay, I have a blueprint of my software. Not the full detail, because I cannot get the halting problem. No. But I have a blueprint. So on that level of a blueprint, I can modify things. I can look at myself in the mirror and say, hmm, if I change this, tweak this model, I'm going to perform differently. That is what we mean by free will. <laughs> and consciousness. And or consciousness. Do you, what do you think is consciousness? Uh, is it simply self-awareness, so including yourself into the model of the world? That's right. It, uh, some people tell me, no, this is only part of consciousness. And then they start telling me what they really mean by consciousness, and I lose them. Yeah. For me, consciousness is having a blueprint of your software. Do you have concerns about the future of AI? 
all the different trajectories of all of our research. Yes. Um, where's your hope? Where the movement heads? Where are your concerns? I, I'm concerned because I know we are building a new species that has the capability of exceeding our, exceeding us, uh, uh, exceeding our capabilities, and can breed itself and take over the world. Absolutely, it's a new species that is uncontrolled. We don't know the degree to which we control it. We don't even understand what it means to be able to control this new species. So I'm concerned. I don't have anything to add to that because it's such a gray area, that unknown. It never happened in history. Yeah. Okay. The only the only time it happened in history was evolution with human beings. Right. And it wasn't very successful, was it? <laughs> Some people uh, say it was a great success. For us it was, but a few people along the way, uh, a few creatures along the way would not agree. So uh, so it's just because it's such a gray area, there's nothing else to say. We have a sample of one. Sample of one. It's us. But we some people the would look at you and say, yeah, but we were looking to you to help us make sure that Correct. sample two works out okay. Actually, we have more than a sample of one. We have theory of theories. Yeah. And that's a good, that's, we don't need to be statisticians. So a sample of one doesn't mean in, in, in poverty of knowledge. It's not. Yeah. Sample of one plus theory, conjectural theory of what could happen. Yeah, That we do have. But I, I really feel helpless in contributing to this argument because I know so little and, uh, and my imagination is limited. And uh, I know how much I don't know, and uh, mm. I. But I'm concerned. You were born and raised in Israel. Born and raised in Israel, yes. And uh, later served in um, Israel military defense forces. In the in the Israel defense force. Yeah. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience? From this experience. There's a kibbutz in there as well. Yes, because I was in the Nachal, which is a um, combination of agricultural work and military service. We were supposed, I, I was really idealist. I wanted to be a member of the kibbutz throughout my life and to live a communal life. And uh, so I prepared myself for that. Uh, slowly, slowly, I <laughs> want the greater challenge. So that's a that's a far world away. Both. What I learned from that, what I can, I, it was a miracle. It was a miracle that I, I served in the nineteen fifties. I I don't know how we survived. The country was under austerity. It tripled its population from 600,000 to a million point eight when I finished college. No one went hungry. Austerity, yes. When you wanted to buy, uh, to make an omelet in a restaurant, you had to bring your own egg. And uh, they imprison people from bringing food from the from, from a farming here, from the villages to the city. But no one went hungry. And I always add to it, and higher education did not suffer any budget cut. They still invested in me, in my wife, in our generation, to get the best education that they could. Okay, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity and i'm trying to pay back now okay it's a miracle that we survived the war of 1948 yeah. we were so close to a second genocide it was all in planned <laughs> but we survived it by a miracle and then the second miracle that not many people talk about 
the next phase. How no one went hungry and the country managed to triple its population. You know what it means to triple population? Imagine the United States mm-hmm. going from, what, 350 million to a trillion? Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. So it's a really tense part of the world. It's a complicated part of the world. Israel yes, yes. and all around. Yes. So religion is, is um, at the core of that complexity. Or religion, one of the yes. components. Religion is a strong motivating cause to many, many people in the Middle East. Yes. In your view, looking back, is religion good for society? That's a good question for robotic, you know. It, Should there's we echoes equip, of that question. Equip robot with uh, religious beliefs. Suppose we, we find out, or we agree that religion is good to you to keep you in, in line. Yeah. Okay. Should we give them about the, the uh, metaphor of a God? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the robot will get it without us also. Why? But the robot will reason by metaphor. And what is the, the most primitive metaphor a child grows with? Mother smile, mm-hmm. father teaching, father image, and mother image. That's God. So, whether I, I you don't... want it or not, the <laughs> robot will, well, assuming, assuming that the robot is going to have a mother and a father, it may only have a programmer which doesn't supply warmth and um, discipline. Yeah. Well, discipline it does. Okay. So, the robot will have this, a model of the trainer, okay? and everything that happens in the world, cosmology and so on, is going to be mapped into the programmer. <laughs> It's God. Yeah. <laughs> the the thing that represents the origin of everything for that robot. That's the most primitive relationship. So it's going to arrive there by metaphor. And so the, the question is if overall that metaphor has served us well as humans. I, I really don't know. I think it did. Um, but, but as long as you keep in mind it's only a metaphor. <laughs> So, <laughs> if you think we can, can you, can we talk about your son? Yes, yes. Can you tell his story? A story? Well, Daniel. The story is known. Is he was abducted in uh, Pakistan by Al Qaeda driven sect, and uh, under various pretenses, I don't even pay attention to what the pretense were. Originally, they wanted to have to have the United States um, deliver some promised airplanes. Uh, it was all made up, and all, all these demands were uh, bogus. I, I don't know really, but uh, eventually he was uh, executed in front of a camera. At the core of that, is yes. hate and intolerance. At the core, yes, absolutely, yes. So, we don't really appreciate the depth of the hate at which, which um, billions of people are educated. We don't understand it. I just listened recently to what they teach you in Mogadishu. <laughs> when when the water stop in the tap mm-hmm. we knew exactly who did it the Jews the Jews we didn't know how but we knew who did it we don't appreciate what it means to us the depth is unbelievable do you think all of us are capable of evil And the education, the indoctrination is really what creates Absolutely evil. Absolutely, we are capable of evil. If you are indoctrinated sufficiently uh, long and in-depth, we are capable of uh, ISIS, we are capable of Nazism. Yes, we are. <clears throat> But the question is whether we, after we have gone through some Western education and we learn that everything is really relative, 
that there's no absolute God. It's only a belief in God. Right? Whether we are capable now of being transformed under certain circumstances to become uh, brutal. Yeah. That is a question. I'm worried about it because some people say yes, given the right circumstances, given the uh, economical, bad economical crisis. Okay? You are capable of doing it too. And that worries me. I, I want to believe it. I'm not capable. This is seven years after Daniel's death, he wrote an article uh, at the Wall Street Journal titled Daniel Pearl and the Normalization of Evil. Yes. What was your mass a message back then and how did it change today over over the years? I, I lost. What was the message? The message was that uh, we are not treating terrorism as a taboo. We are treating it as a bargaining device that is accepted. People have grievance and they go and, sh and bomb restaurants, okay? It's normal. Look, you're even not, not surprised when I tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> 20 years ago, you say, what? For grievance, you go and blow a restaurant? <laughs> Today, it's becoming normalized. The banalization of evil. And we have created that to ourselves by normalizing, by by making it part of political life. It's a political uh, debate. Every terrorist yesterday becomes a freedom fighter today, and tomorrow it becomes a terrorist again. It's a switchable. Right, and so yeah. you, we should call out evil when there's evil. We, if we don't want to be part of it, become it. If we want, if, yeah, if we want to separate good from evil, that's one of the first things that uh, what was the in the Garden of Eden? You remember the first thing <laughs> that God tells him uh, was, "Hey, you want some knowledge? Here's the tree of good and evil." So this evil touched your life personally. Does your heart have anger, sadness, or is it hope? Okay, I see some beautiful people coming from Pakistan. I see beautiful people everywhere. But I see horrible propagation of evil in this country too. It shows you how populistic slogans can catch the mind of the best intellectuals. Today is Father's Day. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, no, I, I heard it. What's uh, what's what's a fond memory you have of Daniel? Oh, many good memories. Uh, immense. He was my mentor, William. He had. Um, a sense of balance that I didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He saw the beauty in every person. He was not as emotional as I am, more looking at things in perspective. He really liked every person. He really grew up with the idea that a foreigner is a reason for curiosity. Not for fear. <clears throat> At one time we went in Berkeley and a homeless came out from some dark alley and he said, hey man, can you spare a dime? <clears throat> I retreated back, you know, two feet back. And then I just hugged him and said, here's a dime, enjoy yourself. Maybe you want some, <laughs> some um, money to take a bus or whatever. Where did he get it? Not for me. <laughs> Do you have advice for young minds today dreaming about creating, as you have dreamt, creating intelligent systems? What is the best way to arrive at new breakthrough ideas and carry them through the fire of criticism and and past conventional ideas? Ask your questions. Freely. 
your questions are never dumb. <laughs> and solve them your own way. <laughs> and don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Look, if they are really dumb, you will find out quickly by trying an arrow to see that they're not leading any place. But follow them and try to understand things your way. That is my uh, advice. I don't know if, if it's going to help anyone. No, that's brilliantly but put. I, there is a lot of uh, the inertia in science, in academia. It is slowing down science. Yeah, those two words, your way, that's a powerful thing. Um, yes, it's against inertia, potentially, against the flow. Against your professor. Against your professor. It is, I, I wrote the book of why yeah. in order to democratize common sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in order to instill rebellious spirit in students, so they wouldn't wait for until the professor get things right. <laughs> <laughs> the, so you wrote the manifesto of the rebellion against the professor. <laughs> against the professor, yes. Uh, so looking back at your life of research, what ideas do you hope ripple through the next many decades? What, what do you hope your legacy will be? I already have a tombstone there. <laughs> <laughs> Carved. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. The, fundament, the fundamental law of counterfactuals. That's what <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple equation. What a counterfactual in terms of a model surgery. Mm -hmm. That's it, because everything follows from that. If you get that, get all the rest. I can die in peace, and my student can derive all my knowledge by mathematical means. The rest follows. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much for talking today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being so attentive and uh, instigating. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. We did it. The coffee helped. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Judea Pearl. And thank you to our presenting sponsor, Cash App. Download it, use code LEXPODCAST, you'll get $10, and $10 will go to FIRST, a STEM education nonprofit that inspires hundreds of thousands of young minds to learn and to dream of engineering our future. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, give it five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter. And now, let me leave you with some words of wisdom from Judea Pearl. You cannot answer a question that you cannot ask and you cannot ask a question that you have no words for. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time.